Quick note before we get started, if I seem a bit off today, that's why. So you might want to wear like a KN95 while you're watching. In Spain, there are more high-speed trains running between major cities than there are airplanes. And well, that's the dream, isn't it? And sure, Spain is a more compact country than the US, but there are a lot of places in the US where we could get the same results or better if we just started building proper rail for once. So this week it's 10 airplanes that should be replaced by bullet trains and it's coming up next. This is City Nerd, weekly content on cities and transportation. Viewer suggested topics always welcome, but this is another one that's been on my list for a long time. Because you know what, I'm a nerd for big data sets, like the kind that are too big to open or next sell. Like the airline origin and destination survey database you can get from the Bureau of Transportation Statistics. It's the primary source of what I'm doing today, but first, I realize Spain is a relatively small, dense European country where the cities are close together, and the US just isn't like that. Well, except when it is. Here's a part of the US that's smaller than Spain but has more people in it. And even better, it's conveniently laid out in a straight line. Oh, and here's another part of the US. Yeah, okay, I cheated and included a bit of Mexico, but this area is also smaller than Spain, but has a higher population. So I am gonna focus on the US today, but when I get to honorable mentions, I'm gonna talk about how my approach might play out in Canada and Mexico. So the approach. The basis for what I'm doing today comes from this file, the origin destination survey of the DB1B coupon file, which the Bureau of Transportation Statistics makes available for each quarter. Today I'm using the fourth quarter of 2019 because of COVID. The OD survey is a 10% sample of all passenger itineraries on domestic commercial flights, and each record represents the leg of an itinerary that may involve one or more passengers, and it includes a lot of different attributes, but what we're focused on is the city markets for the origin and destination, the number of passengers, and the distance between markets. Again, it's just a 10% sample, so to get to an annualized total for each city market pair, I ran a pivot on every possible combination, aggregated the passengers, and then multiplied by 40, which should account for it being a 10% sample and there being four quarters. I suspect this overestimates the annual number a bit since the big holidays occur in Q4, but that's okay, I'm really just trying to compare city pairs. Let's talk about the city market concept really quick because it is important. I don't know how they define it precisely, but it appears to be more of a combined statistical area approach. So for example, they have San Jose Mineta Airport in the San Francisco market. They have Ontario in the LA market when it should maybe be an inland empire. BWI is in the DC market. Providence TF Green International is included in Boston. This is all fine, but I just want to make it clear since I would normally do something like this at the MSA level, not the CSA. Criteria, what I did here was filter for city market pairs that are less than 500 miles apart, which is a distance that should make high-speed rail competitive, and then I just ranked them 1 through 10. So I kept this very simple. I didn't apply a distance factor that decays between 250 and 600 miles the way I normally would. Note that the decay forward from 250 miles is kind of already baked in. Those are the people who are driving instead of flying in the first place. There are a lot of great city pairs for high-speed rail in the 100 to 200 mile range that just won't show up on this list. So just consider this another useful lens for identifying promising rail connections, but not a be-all, end-all answer. Also, I do recognize that 500 miles is a bit of an arbitrary cutoff. So when I get to the honorable mentions, I'll give you the city market pairs that would have made the list if I raised the threshold to 700 miles. So to summarize, the list is the 10 US air travel origin destination pairs with the highest passenger volume for city markets that are under 500 miles apart. Make sense? Okay, let's get into it. Number 10 is Dallas to Houston. For each of these, I'll give you what I estimated as the full 2019 ridership, 
but I'm also going to give you the number of one-way flights on an arbitrary upcoming day. In this case, Sunday, October 16th, 2022. Keep in mind, these flights aren't apples to apples. The JSX flights, for example, are smaller airplanes, but I think it's an interesting enough additional data point to include. Also, as we get down toward 250 miles or below, which Dallas to Houston is, high-speed rail is actually going to shift more market share away from highway travel than from air travel. Probably a lot more. The Texas Central website says that over 90% of travel between the two markets is currently by highway. So the fact that this even makes the top 10 at all for an air travel list is pretty amazing. Number nine is Atlanta to Orlando. I'm showing 23 one-way flights from Atlanta, which is lower than what the OD data suggest, but I assume the supply of flights varies a ton seasonally because of the nature of travel to Orlando. Also, you wonder how many of these are Delta transfers on longer itineraries? Probably a lot, but there is precedent for integrating ticketing and baggage handling between air and high-speed rail. It's just the U.S. will probably be the last country to figure it out. Number eight is New York to Boston, which is actually number two if I use my usual methodology for evaluating city pairs. So let's look at it. I'm showing 66 flights from the three major New York airports plus Westchester on our sample date, six of them going into Providence, which again, the data set flags as being part of the Boston market. So yeah, 66 flights a day between two cities this size that are around optimal high-speed rail distance is definitely a policy failure. But let's look at something else while we're here. According to consulting group LEK, the mode share for air travel in this market is only 6%. 80% of the trips are by car or bus. So if there are 66 one-way flights, you can imagine how enormous the potential market is if they can ever manage to build effective high-speed rail in this section of the Northeast Corridor. Number seven is LA to Sacramento. And this is one that doesn't usually show up for me because my methodology says the distance is too long to grab very much mode share from highway. But this also highlights what's maybe a shortcoming of my approach, which is that a state capital probably has significantly more travel demand than a similarly sized city that isn't a state capital. I haven't analyzed this as just a hunch. I'm thinking lawmakers, their staff, lobbyists, state agency management, consultants, you know, people who have to travel a lot. Number six is San Francisco to San Diego. 46 flights total. This is another one that makes sense, but doesn't usually show up in a top 10 because of distance. Recognize that in the Northeast Corridor, you have alternatives. The Acela, conventional rail, a lot of bus service. You don't really have a reasonable rail service in California right now, and I don't think you have nearly the bus service. So the result is a lot of planes in the air. Number five is San Francisco to Las Vegas. Again, not really a distance you want to drive and no rail connection whatsoever. So you can see how we're starting to build out a California high-speed rail network just from the nation's big air travel OD pairs. For number four, let's keep building out our network with Los Angeles to Phoenix. 54 flights total from five LA airports. I don't know exactly how you do the network here and how far into the Inland Empire you can run at any kind of speed, but maybe something like this. Number three is LA to Las Vegas, so let's keep going. You know, if you live in the Northeast, you might think it's bad that Acela mostly doesn't even run very fast in a lot of sections, but at least you have rail to soak up some demand. There is no rail to Vegas. Everybody flies or drives, and there are 84 flights from the five LA airports on October 16th. The Brightline website, they're the ones who are working on the LA to Las Vegas rail line, says there are 50 million one-way trips a year, and 85% of those are on the highway. So as many planes as there are making this trip, it's a pretty small fraction of the overall demand. Okay, I'm gonna to get to the top two and some interesting honorable mentions, but first, 
give the video a like and consider subscribing if you're in favor of every single one of these flights being replaced by a mode of travel that's more comfortable, more enjoyable, faster, and better for the planet. Investigate the Patreon if you're interested in more content and conversation. There's a new video going up this week. And sub count check. I don't think I've gone to Italy at all. So let's fill up San Siro, home of AC Milan and Inter Milan, both big European clubs. You know, the Serie A stadiums just don't do that much for me when it comes to urbanism, but this one's probably on my bucket list just for sheer atmosphere. So my criteria for this list were super simple. Just had to be an air distance under 500 miles. But that's a bit arbitrary and high speed rail can be competitive at longer distances. It's just tougher. So here are the city market pairs that would have made the list if I extended the threshold up to 700 miles. From top to bottom, DC to Atlanta, San Francisco to Seattle, Atlanta to Miami, and Chicago to DC. Notably absent from this entire video is the top high-speed rail city pair in the US, which I don't think is arguable, and that is New York to DC. Part of the reason the air passenger volume isn't top 10 is because it already has probably the best intercity rail service available in the US. It's maybe 30 trains a day, 10 of them are Acela's, but the Acela only saves you like 30 or 40 minutes. I don't know. I don't understand how it's 2022 and we're just still so bad at this. I stuck to the US for this video because that's the data set I had. But now that we've got a feel for the level of air traffic the top 10 in the US generates, let's look at a couple other obvious city pairs. Mexico City and Guadalajara, around 300 miles apart. On October 16th, I've got 31 flights out of Mexico City International and another five out of the new Felipe Angeles International on the north side of the city. This is in addition to who knows how many buses, hundreds I think, running out of multiple ginormous bus terminals, which are like airports unto themselves. So yeah, there's a lot of demand. And then Toronto to Montreal, this is 38 flights combined out of the two Toronto airports. So again, similar to some of the US entries we're seeing on this list, I talked this city pair to death in a previous video, so I won't belabor it, but let's just call this another data point in support of high-speed rail running along this corridor. Number two is DC to Boston. The Amtrak Northeast Corridor service is kind of bad by developed world standards, but it's the most useful passenger rail infrastructure we have in the US. Even that only goes so far though. The travel time on the Acela just isn't gonna compete with air, which at this distance, it still should. But the result is you've got 62 flights a day right now. And yeah, I do recognize this is Providence and Baltimore erasure. And I apologize sincerely. And number one, if you've been following the logic of this list, shouldn't be too hard to figure out. It is LA to San Francisco. So the air passenger volume between these two markets is just about triple anything else on this list. It's just a monster. And the flight schedule bears it out too. On October 16th, you've got a whopping 138 different flights out of LA across the 15 different possible airport combinations. The Northeast is by far the most important corridor for high-speed rail in the US. So the difference here is I believe that the existing NEC is already soaking up some of the travel demand from air where California they're basically starting at zero when it comes to intercity rail. I mean, unless you consider a Coast Starlight that runs once a day and has a 12 hour runtime to Oakland, an actual train service. Let's get this built, people. That's all I got. Thanks for watching and thanks to the patrons who kept me stocked up on ibuprofen and hot and sour soup the last few days while I got over COVID. It does mean a lot. I'll be back with a new episode next week and I'll see you then.